Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is mutually assured destruction. This is something that you'll hear of outside of traditional academic settings, so it's important to know. Let's get to it. The basic idea behind mutually assured destruction is that if you have two countries, each with nuclear weapons, the relationship between them may be contentious, but ultimately, it will be peaceful. To unravel this, I want to begin by thinking about the basic assumptions behind mutually assured destruction and how those assumptions purport to map on to this peaceful outcome that I just described. The first assumption is that the states are rational and self-preserving. In other words, they are not the type of madman that Richard Nixon once tried to create the persona of during the Vietnam War. Of course, there's a bit of irony there. If you look at mutually assured destruction, the initials are M-A-D, and so sometimes you'll hear mutually assured destruction just being abbreviated as MAD. But despite that, we can't have mad men floating around within this framework. The second assumption is that both of the states have large stockpiles of nuclear weapons. And the third assumption is that each side has a secured second strike. The first two were at least straightforward in terms of its meaning. This one is a bit of jargon, so let me explain what that's talking about. Secured second strike. That's saying that if you were to be struck first in the event of a war, you would have enough nuclear weapons left over to be able to fire away at the opponent despite having been struck preemptively. You can see the United States was concerned about having a second strike capability based off of its nuclear doctrine. We've talked in the past about Operation Chrome Dome. These were the flights that would take off from the United States and fly to various areas closer to the Soviet Union so it would be faster for them to drop bombs on the Soviet Union in the event of a nuclear war. A side benefit of this was that the United States had a moving nuclear arsenal, which would make it more difficult for the Soviet Union to locate where the bombers were, because they weren't just sitting on the ground, and take them out in a very short period of time before they might receive a message to go ahead and drop their payloads on the Soviet Union. The desire to maintain a secure second strike is more explicitly seen in the U.S. nuclear triad. This is the idea that the United States has three separate types of delivery systems for their nuclear weapons, one of which are bombers, just like the types of planes that were going through Operation Chrome Dome, but also other sets of bombers, and of course they continued to have bombers even after the Chrome Dome operation ended. Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs, were the second part of this U.S. nuclear triad. These, of course, sit in the middle of the United States, in silos, waiting for a button to be pressed, and when that button is pressed, they will take off with rocket engines and go very high up into the sky, head over toward the Soviet Union, and then fall toward their targets. Nuclear-armed submarines formed the final part of the U.S. nuclear triad where these would just sit on the ocean floor waiting for that message to fire nuclear weapons. And when they received that message, they would head up toward the surface and then fire a weapon out of the water into the air, just like an ICBM, and go toward their target. The idea for the triad was that if the Soviet Union were to somehow find a way to destroy all of the U.S. planes at the same time, for example, that there would still be alternative methods. The Soviet Union would simultaneously have to figure out how to destroy three separate vectors all at the same time to guarantee that the U.S. did not have an ability to retaliate with their nuclear arsenal. Going a step further, secured second strikes explain why the United States, as well as the Soviet Union, maintained a nuclear arsenal during the Cold War that was capable of destroying the world many times over. It wasn't that the United States was ever planning to use all of those nuclear weapons at once. Instead, the concern was about a Soviet preemptive strike. What if, in a first strike action, the Soviet Union destroyed half, two-thirds, three-fourths, maybe even 90% of the U.S. nuclear arsenal? It was imperative, from the United States' perspective, to have a large enough nuclear arsenal 
that that remaining 10% would still be sufficient to cause lots of damage to the Soviet Union. Moving away from the United States for a moment, concerns about secured second strikes are why the United Kingdom has something known as a letter of last resort. All of the British nuclear weapons are on submarines, and on each of those submarines is a letter. In the event of the complete destruction of the UK government, the captain of the submarine is to go to the letter, open it up, and read what's inside. We don't actually know what's written in any of these letters of last resort. It's only information that the Prime Minister knows, and once the Prime Minister is out of office, the letters are torn up, and we have new letters being put in by the next Prime Minister. The idea, though, is that even if the British government no longer exists, it's fully possible for the British government to command their nuclear arsenals in a way that might deter the attack in the first place. Those letters, for example, might say, take all of your nuclear weapons and aim them at the capital of the country that caused the destruction of the UK government. To be clear, you can cheat a little bit on the secured part of the second strike by just being faster to deploy the response. This is in part why the United States exercises what is known as a one-man rule. That's because it only takes one person the President of the United States, with some confirmation from the Secretary of Defense, to order a nuclear attack. You can also cut speed by shifting to a launch-on-warning posture, where instead of waiting for a nuclear weapon to actually strike before deploying your own, you fire your nuclear weapons once your radar has observed nuclear weapons coming at you. You can think about this as being useful for an insecure second strike, because as long as you're fast enough, even if your nuclear weapons are easily targeted, you can still make use of them to destroy the other side. Those are the three premises that mutually assured destruction is based on. What do they buy you? Well, think about it this way. Imagine you're the Soviet Union, you have a lot of nuclear weapons, you have a secured second strike, and you're not crazy. You wanna stay alive. You could warn the United States if you try taking anything of ours, we're going to nuke you. The United States, also being self-preserving, having a large nuclear arsenal and a secured second strike, could fire back with a similar warning. If you take anything of ours, we're going to nuke you. If those things are of sufficient value, then there should be clear credibility that that kind of threat is real. It's credible. And if that's the case, you don't have very much incentive to try to go after those targets. If you do, you'll have a nuclear weapon fired at you, and it may be the case that you'll end up firing a nuclear weapon back, and then we'll have a large-scale nuclear exchange to the point that we're all destroyed. And so this threat of mutually assured destruction leads neither side wanting to actively go after the other. Mutually assured destruction leads to peace. It's a contentious peace, because it's the most destructive weapons of all that are actually backing that piece. But because they're so scary, because they're so destructive, neither side has an incentive to break from the status quo. Now that we understand the central prediction of mutually assured destruction, let's go back through each of those premises and understand why they're necessary to get this expectation. Why do we need rationality and self-preservation? Well, if you have an irrational actor who's just doing random things all the time, you're not going to have a peaceful result. Two sides with large nuclear arsenals and one of them crazy is a recipe for disaster. Likewise, you have to have a self-preserving actor because if you have someone who has suicidal intents, no matter how rational in the sense of being strategic and responding to incentives that that individual is, they may very well just start the nuclear war because they think it's fun. Again, not a very peaceful outcome. Why do you need a large nuclear stockpile? Well, imagine that your opponent had just one single nuclear weapon. There may be some object out there in dispute between the two of you, 
that the opponent currently has status quo control over that you're willing to challenge and pick a fight over because you care so much about it. And while it's possible that the impending fight will result in a nuclear weapon launched at you, it's also possible that that nuclear weapon might miss, or it might not actually cause that much damage, or you may be able to shoot it out of the sky. And if that's the case, we don't have destruction, we have damage. The secured second strike part is the most straightforward. If one side can devise a way to completely destroy all of their opponent's nuclear weapons at the same time, then there's no real threat of retaliation. And so mutual destruction isn't actually assured. It's just one-sided destruction. And that's particularly dangerous because it gives the side that can do that an incentive to strike first to make sure that they capture everything and prevent their opponent from doing anything in response. Zooming out, we can capture these sorts of incentives within a bargaining framework similar to what we've been working with in the past. Imagine that we have two sides, the West and the East. And there's some good that's in dispute between the two of them. The West wants everything and the East wants everything. They're diametrically opposed. Despite that intense conflict between them, we can still get peace. And the solution is centered around what the balance of power looks like between them, which I'm illustrating with this line. Think of this line in the following way. If the West and the East were to fight a war, what would the expected distribution of the land between them look like? Well, draw the line right there. That's our expected distribution. If we broker a solution that matches that expected distribution, then no one would have an incentive to fight. They're getting exactly what they would get if they did. Fortunately, we don't have to be so exact. There's some wiggle room here. Think of this from the perspective of the West. If they were to fight, they would have the territory as divided like we saw before. But in the process, people would die, buildings would be destroyed, and money would be spent on unproductive purposes. Those total costs we can represent with the red rectangle right there. If we were to draw a border anywhere within the red rectangle, the West would still prefer that outcome to fighting a war. While it's true that by fighting a war, the West would capture a little bit more, but it's not worth paying those costs to do so. We can do something similar with the East. Imagine that we drew the border anywhere within the right rectangle. Well, the East could get a little bit more by fighting a war, but after taking into account those costs, it's not worth it. We say that any agreement that falls within either of those two rectangles is mutually preferred to war. This is the bargaining range. It's the range of settlements that each side is satisfied with when they compare that outcome to fighting a war instead. Key for our purposes is that the size of that bargaining range is equal to the total costs of war. Well, let's think about what happens when you add nuclear weapons and the logic of mutually assured destruction to the mix. The idea behind MAD is that trying to move the status quo is very dangerous, because if you do, it's reasonable to expect that if the other side values the thing at stake sufficiently, that you may suffer a nuclear retaliation. And then you may fire a nuclear weapon, and then they might fire a nuclear weapon, and the costs will just be enormous. Well, if you add those costs to the previously existing costs, now that we've endowed the West and the East with nuclear weapons, what we're seeing here is that the bargaining range has become huge. Intuitively, one would expect now that the bargaining range is very large, that it would be easy, relatively speaking, to strike an agreement within it. And that is true for many different mechanisms that cause war. People who are very optimistic about mutually assured destruction would tell you that having more countries with nuclear weapons really isn't that big of a deal. If nuclear weapons promote peace, then it's not worth efforts to try to stop countries from developing nuclear weapons. Those countries that have explored nuclear weapons or actively pursued nuclear weapons should just be allowed to acquire them. 
and that if they did, the world would be more peaceful as a result. And they would point to what happened during the Cold War as an example of this. The United States and the Soviet Union had one of the most intense relationships that has ever been seen in the history of mankind. And yet, despite that intense conflict between them, the war never got hot. It was a cold war. It wasn't an active war. However, there are a few counterpoints to this. One argument is that the reason that we started observing peace after the end of World War II, through the Cold War, and also a peace between major powers following the Cold War, is just because military technology has generally become very destructive, aside from nuclear weapons. And the large costs of conventional arms are sufficient to deter countries. Nuclear weapons are just overkill. Another argument is that a lot of the peace that we observed during the Cold War, and especially after the Cold War, has been the result of international commerce. When states are trading together, then fighting a war becomes increasingly costly because they'll lose out on the gains from trade in the event of a fight. So by this argument, it's not nuclear weapons that have kept the peace recently. It's been trade. And even if nuclear weapons do have some sort of peaceful effect, there has to be some concern that a random event, like a bear storming an Air Force base, could accidentally spark World War III. Because that did almost happen. And we should ask ourselves whether that risk is worthwhile. Aside from that, there's still your basic power politics concerns. The types of deals that you strike to avoid war need to be based off of the balance of power what each state would expect to receive in the event of a war. Well, if you give your opponent nuclear weapons, that's going to shift the balance of power away from you and favorably toward the opponent. So allowing another country to develop nuclear weapons, even if it may promote peace in the long term, is still going to cost you something in the type of negotiated settlement that you'll have to strike to avoid war. All told, even if you buy the central idea behind mutually assured destruction, it's still not obvious that you as a country should be promoting others acquiring nuclear weapons. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.